Welcome to worship. I'm Pastor Ben. I'm glad that you're here with us whenever it is, wherever you are. Today's a little bit different than some of our previous weeks. It's just myself here at the church building and Chris in the back. Jordan, our worship leader, isn't here today because he just became a dad last week on January 31st. Him and his wife, Stephanie, welcome their new baby girl, Audrey, Rosalie, Arguez, into the world. Thank you, everyone that has been praying for them. Mom and baby are both healthy, and they're taking some time together to be family. So we're so excited for them and happy to give them that space. Jordan's still going to be here with us in a way because... Beforehand, he had been working on music, curating it, crafting it, recording it so we could use it in our worship together as a community. So I'm so thankful that he's done that for us. Let's take a moment now to center ourselves, ground ourselves. Let's pray. God, we thank you for the gift of new life. We thank you for Audrey, Rosalie coming into the world and joining our community we are so excited to meet her and we are just filled with gratitude and joy at the the gift of a new baby we pray for jordan and a stephanie as uh, i'm sure they're tired and uh, getting used to having a new family member so we just ask for your presence and blessing upon them at this exciting time. I pray for us as a community that we can be centered in your grace and love as we're at all these different points on the spiritual journey. We ask that your spirit will fill us and we ask that our worship will give us strength for the things to come this next week. We pray all these things in Jesus' name. Amen. We invite you to prepare your hearts at home and join us in worship. Our first song, Come As You Are. Come out of sadness from wherever you've been. Come broken hearted, let rescue be. Find your mercy, O oh, sinner, come near. Earth has no sorrow that heaven can heal. Earth has no sorrow that heaven can heal. So lay down your burdens, lay down your are broken, lift up your face, oh wanderer, come home, you're not too far, so lay down your hurt, lay down your heart, and come as you There's hope for the hopeless and all who have seen. Come sit at the table, come taste the grace. There's rest for the weary, the rest that endures. Earth has no sorrow that heaven can cure. So lay down your burden. Lay 
down your hall and come as you are and come as you are there is joy for the morning oh sinner be still earth has no sorrow the heaven can heal earth has no sorrow down your burdens, lay down your shame, all who are broken, lift up your faith, oh wanderer, come home, you're not too down your heart, lay down your heart, and come as you are, and come as you are, and come as you Join us in worship, Waymaker. Keep 
light in the darkness my god this is who you are 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 this is who you Spirit, fill my words and our hearts that we might hear from you. Amen. Our scripture for today is from John chapter 3, verses 4 and 5. Nicodemus said to him, How can anyone be born after having grown old? Can one enter a second time into the mother's womb and be born? Jesus answered, Very truly, I tell you, no one can enter the kingdom of God without being born of water and spirit. The spiritual life grows within us across seasons and over years and years. And today, what I want to do is offer a pretty specific map for what this looks like, this process, what, what it is. This slow process of formation can be a little foreign to us because it's in contrast to the pervasive quick results, pop spirituality that we find so loud on places like Instagram that comes in the form of secular self-help formulas or evangelical breakthrough promises or new age woo-woo techniques. And on the surface, all of these Spiritualities might look a little bit different, but at their center, at the core, they're really the same thing because they're all promising this thing that none of them can ever possibly give. They're offering spiritual birth, uh, this deep and meaningful, authentic existence. They're offering it but without the pregnancy that you need for a birth, without the process and the struggle. And that's the very stuff of the spirit. They're offering spirituality without spirit is what it comes down to most often. Because the spiritual life is always a type of birth. And even if these spiritual um, products offer a program that you can buy into whether literally or figuratively they can't offer the results that they promise simply because the reality is the truth is that the spirit's never for sale the spirit and the spiritual life is grace It is grace, which means it's completely free and and it's about freedom. And you cannot buy or sell what's free. You just can't do it. You can only receive it and share it and pass it on. And I think that's actually unnerving for us because we're saturated by this culture that is so based on markets and buying and selling. It tries to make us believe that anything and everything can, can be purchased for a price or can be, can be sold off. But the spiritual life, you can't buy it. You can't 
by it. And I think that's why spirituality and the spiritual journey is actually pretty hard in America and our market culture. The spirit can only be received and tended and cared for and shared. It's as simple as that. So, okay, all right, you're saying, Pastor Ben, sure, but but what does that look like? What's this alternative, this other way look like? Margaret Gunther. Margaret Gunther has outlined what I think is the clearest map for the process of spirituality and the spiritual life that I've found. And I want to name the contours of this map to help us grasp where we might be along the way in our process of spiritual growth and journey. And and I want to offer this so we can kind of use it as the roadmap for discerning where God is working in our lives and in the world and, and, and where God is calling us to and moving us to. And this comes from her book, Holy listening. And Margaret's an Episcopal priest in New York, and she's professor of ascetical theology at the General Theological Seminary. I'm not even sure what that means, but it sounds pretty awesome. So Margaret picks up the metaphor that Jesus uses in his invitation to Nicodemus. Jesus tells Nicodemus, hey, you, you got to be born of both water and spirit. And so she takes this and she, she builds upon it. And, and Margaret says that the spiritual birth process really closely mirrors the physical and bodily birth process. That's sort of the image and metaphor and map that we can actually use. And if you, so if you want to make sense of this metaphysical experience or thing, then what you can really do is look at this very concrete and tangible material thing. And that's really the heart of Christianity, that process, right? Christianity is about incarnation and and the incarnation which is at the center of everything, says that it's through and within the material, physical world that the Spirit is flowing and moving and working. And that's actually why when we gather as community that our central ritual is communion. Because communion is this very concrete reminder to look and discern the body and blood dripping through things in the form of bread and wine. This very spiritual thing are in these most common physical things. The material is the gateway and door into the spiritual through the discernment of faith. So building out this metaphor, this connection between the physical and biological and the spiritual, um, the starting place uh, for any biological birth is always an initial relationship. You're not going to have a birth without a relationship. Two persons who are other and different come together to create this starting point of conception. If there's no relations, then there's no pregnancy and no birth and no new life. And so in much the same way, spiritual birth happens out of the coming together of two that are other and different between the human, the human pursuit of God and the things that are holy. That's the starting point. There has to be this turn to God that we make intentionally 
Otherwise, spirituality can't begin to grow within us. We have a responsibility. God doesn't force God's self on us. God is waiting. God is patient. God is looking for us. And God is there and ready to receive us when we're ready to make that turn to relationship, to take spirituality and the things of the Spirit seriously. So that's sort of point one. Then after things begin, things start to change with with, uh, the biological uh, pregnancy. Things start to change, and it's, it's unseen at first. Nobody knows, and it's barely perceptible. Margaret says that there's this long period of waiting and uncertainty. She says the birth giver thinks... Maybe I'm not even pregnant, but somehow I feel different. And for the physical birth giver, small things start to change. Tastes and moods and how clothes fit and even balance. How you're moving in the world starts to change just a little bit. And these things often get attributed to other things, right? That's... That, that's not our go-to. I remember when my wife Diana was pregnant with our first son, Harold. Um, she was starting to feel these little shifts within her. And so naturally, when that was happening, what did she do? Uh, she Googled it, right? <laughs> that's what we do right now. Uh, so she gets on Google and uh, she's able to narrow things down. Uh, it's very clear that she's either pregnant or she has cancer because that's how internet healthcare works, right? It's something pretty normal or it's cancer. Now it's like it's either allergies or COVID, right? There's no in between. It's so extreme. Uh, uh, but the point of all of this is, is that for both the physical birth giver and the spiritual birth giver, you start to feel something that's happening to you and within you. There are little things that are changing your perceptions, what you're noticing, where you're putting emphasis, where you're spending your time, what matters to you, what's stirring your excitement. And you're not sure what to do with it most of the time. I grew up in a pretty theologically conservative tradition, and I went to Biola, the Bible Institute of Los Angeles, for college. It's this fairly conservative Christian school. And I remember that I came to this point during my freshman year where I was reading all this theology uh, for my classes, and I was studying, and just all of it felt dead. It was just dead ink on dead pages. They weren't speaking to me, not to my soul, not to my experience of God and the world. And so I remember very specifically one day uh, going to the reading room at the library and pulling this obscure academic journal off the shelf, and it had a bunch of theology in it, and it was written by these feminist theologians. And I'm like, whoa, what is this even doing at a place like Biola? This is sort of taboo. And so I, I, I started reading it. And with each sentence, I started to like feel something within me. I was feeling just more and more alive as I read on and on. And um, I really had this renewed sense within me that the world was burning with meaning and and the presence of the holy was was all around so i kept coming back to these journals that that were inspiring for me and i wasn't sure what to do with it all yet i think that's a big thing in our spiritual journey these changes we don't know what to to do with them all i knew was i need to keep coming back here because I, I'm finding life here in these pages. And when you find life somewhere, you just have to keep coming back for more and more and more. Margaret says 
there are those who feel that something is happening to and within them. Their tastes are changing and their balance has shifted. And these changes are signs that new layers and depths of spirituality are growing in you. And it's so important when you notice this, you need to foster it. You need to foster it. You need to pay attention. You need to care for it. You, you can't ignore it. You can't stuff it down. It's like the pregnant woman, as she's having these changes, it doesn't make sense to uh, keep the same clothes. It's like you, you need to get new clothes that, that fit better your experience and accommodate your birth-giving body uh, and your diet changes and, and, and your exercise routines change. And, and in the same way, when, when we're becoming spiritual birth givers, we need to put on new practices and try new routines to accommodate the spirituality that's growing within us and, and that's changing us. It's so important. We have to make those shifts and we have to have the courage to, to try new things. And after this season of shifting and changing and growing, the physical pregnancy culminates by moving into the intensity of active labor and that whole process, which is going to end by bringing forth this new life, this baby into the world. And this is a very intentional moment in the process. After nine months of of waiting, these final hours become incredibly active, and it's important to bring the work then of, of pushing into sync with the natural rhythms of the contractions, right? There's this synergy between what's happening to the birth giver biologically, what they're receiving in the contractions, and what the birth giver is contributing in her effort and her pushing. And this work is painful, so I've heard. And this work best happens in a small community where, where you're surrounded by a few loved ones and then and then you also have maybe a midwife or a doctor, a doula, some experienced professional there with you to help you navigate the process. And then at the end of this intense labor, there's the beauty of new life. This, this child, the creation bursts forth from from the watery womb into the world, the same way you, you see why the authors of the creation story, creation, all of it bursts forth from the watery beginnings. It, it's the, the holiest of holy moments. Birth connects us deeply with the sacred. And so the parallels are just so many between the physical and spiritual process of, uh, of giving birth, and you're probably sensing some of them. I just want to name a, a few, and, and these you, you, you can explore and just lean so deeply in this metaphor. We're just, we're just starting. Um, spiritual birth giving is marked by long stretches of waiting and slow changes and growth that you can barely even sense, right? And you're not sure what to make sense, uh, how to make sense of it. So that's one piece. But then there, it has to include moments of intensity and crisis and transformation, that active labor process. And, and like physical birth, um, spiritual birth is best done in community with some close loved ones and also with some professionals and guides and mentors to help you navigate and understand the process. And then, right, with a physical birth, there's regular office visits that, that need to, to be done uh, to, to do it well. And that might be compared to the weekly worship and liturgy. You don't want to miss the doctor's appointment, I think, in the same way. You don't want to miss the liturgical rhythm of the church. And then uh, in physical birth, the, the parents have the app that's telling you, oh, the baby's as big as a pea, the baby's as big 
as a tangerine, right? And you're checking that every day to know about the baby. I think in the same way, like that app, our scriptures function to tell us who we are, what the world is, where we're at in the story and life of God. And we need to be checking that constantly. And and this network and community that surrounds the process, these whole health care systems that we have to to bring babies into the world, uh, we also have a network uh, for the spiritual life, and that's, that's called the church. And these things are so essential. Like you could do it on your own. You could, you could have a a baby on your own. Nobody there. It's going to be incredibly difficult. Um, It's going to be probably very dangerous for the new life that's coming into the world and, and that wants to emerge. And I think in the same way, when we try and do spirituality on our own, uh, it's dangerous um, and, and it can end up instead of giving life, it, it, it can give us something other. And so the thing then with this whole process is that at the end of it, we get invited to do it again. We have to do it again. The 13th century mystic Meister Eckhart said that God is so filled with love that God's ready to repeatedly be born in the empty and welcoming space of our soul. So my prayer is, may you be pregnant with the holy and may you birth the sacred and do it well and do it with community in your heart and then through your heart let that be birthed and spread abroad in the world let's pray god we thank you for the tangible and physical world through which we can learn and see and sense the spirit and that which is holy help us to do this well to be caring and thoughtful and focused in this work because it's so important you're coming into the world through our lives god love God, who is love, is coming to the world through our bodies, God. That's so important. Help us to tend our souls and our spirituality that's, that's coming to life in us and spreading life all around. We pray all these things in Jesus' name. Amen. We're going to sing one more song together i invite you to be loud at home sing along look up the lyrics whatever you need to do also i invite you to to respond uh respond to the spirit working in your life one way that we do that is through our ties and our offerings you can give here at risehere.org click on give Endless Alleluia. In the moments when 
countless miracles of life around us point like arrows to your name let all voices rise all creation cry singing out in Heaven song singing out in 